Praise the Lord, everyone. Let's stand. We'll go before the Lord in prayer this morning. It is good to see y'all. Let's pray. Wonderful, sweet Jesus. Thank you, God, for your presence. Thank you, Lord, for your blessings. Thank you, God, for the honor to be able to come into your house, into your presence, to open up your word, to learn of you, to hear from you, to worship you. Thank you, God, for that honor. Father, I pray that you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear and hearts to receive the words that you would speak to us this day. Father, you be the teacher, you be the minister, and we'll thank you for it all. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Saints of the Most High, we have a new Columbusite. I can't tell you how excited I am that Joe and Johanna have moved to Columbus this weekend. It's exciting. Um, and so one of her first acts of moving to Columbus is hearing me pray for her. Uh, we're going to go to um, a passage. I'm not so sure really how familiar that the entire passage is. Um, but we're going to go to the book of Isaiah, chapter 1, this morning. Um, and to begin, we're going to read verses 16 through 20. Full disclosure, my brain was going a completely different direction, Sister Wanda. I was in a total different vein. And I decided to come here to the church yesterday to pray. And as I was praying, the Lord spoke and said, that's not what I want you to talk about tomorrow. And I said, yes, sir. Give me ears to hear what it is. And the Lord spoke. And um, to be honest, I fussed a little. Um, because he wouldn't let me finish praying until I put notes in my phone. But I was obedient and did what he said. And so here we are. Isaiah chapter 1, verses 16 through 20. Wash you, make you clean. Put away the evil of your doings from before mine eyes. Cease to do evil, learn to do well, seek judgment, relieve the oppressed, judge the fatherless, plead for the widow. And I love verse 18. Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If you be willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured with the sword. For the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. I have a really spiritual song to share with everybody today. Please don't crucify me yet, I promise. I really do have a spiritual application for this, but pray. Deep down in Louisiana, close to New Orleans, way back up in the woods among the evergreens, there stood a log cabin made of earth and wood where lived a country boy named Johnny B. Good, who never, ever learned to read or write so well, but he could play the guitar just to ring in the bell. Jo go, go, Johnny, go, go. Go, Johnny, go, go, Johnny, be good. I'll spare you the other two verses, but basically, don't crucify me, Sister Pruitt. I see that smile. Don't, Pastor, I got, I got it. It's going to be all right. I'll spare you the other two verses. They're not bad. There's nothing wrong in the song, actually, at all. The song really is about a young poor boy in New Orleans, Louisiana, who had a wonderful talent for playing the guitar. Now, he had hope poured into him from his mama. The third verse talks about his mama said, boy, if you do it right, you're going to grow up, you're going to lead a band, and your name is going to be in light, son. Johnny, go, go, be good. Everybody was going to come to hear Johnny be good play his guitar. And so the whole point, really, of the song, Sister Lily, was to tell Johnny to go and follow his dream. In other words, Johnny was too good to simply sit on his dreams. He needed to go and follow that. He may have known he was good. We don't know. The song doesn't really tell us. But just knowing that he was good wasn't good enough to get him anywhere. He needed to do something about it. 
So the songwriter put all the effort into writing the song simply to tell Johnny to go. Johnny, go. Go be good. Go be good and follow your dream. I promise I'll bring something spiritual out of this. Hang tight. But I do need to shift here for just a few moments, and then we'll bring it all together towards the end. And I understand that it might feel like a weird shift, but in Jesus' name, it'll be all right. In Scripture, there are three types of covenants. There is a conditional covenant, an unconditional covenant, and a combination where covenants contain both conditional and unconditional pieces. A conditional covenant is usually based on God doing something according to his word as long as we, the person or the nation or whoever, is obedient to whatever God has said. An example of a couple of conditional covenants in Scripture. God made a covenant with Adam and Eve that as long as you do well and don't eat of the tree of knowledge, life is going to be amazing. But the trick to that is if you don't do well, if you do eat of the tree, and we know that they did, then it just wasn't good. It was conditioned upon Adam and Eve's obedience to the Lord. There was another covenant, and one of many, I just picked out a couple, that God made a covenant with Israel after receiving the law at Mount Sinai. Again, it was If you follow my word, I will bless you. I will keep you. I will provide for you. But it's on you. Are you going to obey? Are you going to do what I tell you to do? It's a conditional covenant. An unconditional covenant is really simply based on God said he would do it, period. Doesn't matter how we respond. Doesn't matter what else happens. God said he would do it. And that's it. One of those unconditional covenants is the covenant that God made with Abraham. God told Abraham, I am going to make you a great nation. I am going to bless you. I'm going to make your name great. I'm going to make you to be a blessing to others and to bless those that bless you and to curse those that curse you. That's happened. Everybody knows Israel. Everybody knows Abraham. Everybody knows about that. God did make Abraham into a great nation. It didn't matter whether Abraham obeyed or not. He did. But it didn't matter whether he did or not. God said it, and it came to pass. Another um, unconditional covenant was the covenant that God made with Noah after the flood. When Noah and his family and all the animals got off of the ark, After that major flood and Noah began to offer sacrifice to the Lord, God said, I am putting my rainbow in the sky. This is my covenant with you that I promise you I will never again destroy the earth with a flood. Every time we see a rainbow, it should remind us that God is a covenant-keeping God. What he says, he will do. I had lunch with a, a dear friend of mine yesterday, and um, this, this friend said, you know, God isn't necessarily faithful to us. He's faithful to his word. Because that means it's not always dependent on us. It's based on how good he is, how faithful he is. And that's really what an unconditional covenant is all about. There are combination covenants within Scripture where uh, a covenant has both conditional and unconditional aspects to it. One of those, uh, an example of that is the covenant that God made with David. God said that as long as David and his descendants would be obedient to the Lord, there would always be a king on the throne of David's line. That was conditional to their obedience. We know that that didn't happen because there ain't no king in Israel at this point. However, there was an unconditional promise that God made to David, and God told David, I am going to bring an everlasting king out of your lineage. That didn't change. How many thankful that God keeps his word? Because when God told David that there's going to be an everlasting king coming from your lineage, he was talking about Jesus. God keeps his covenant. 
So with the story of the worldly song, again, please don't crucify me, and God's covenant with man, let's go back to our text. If you go to Isaiah chapter 1, it is a rough chapter to read. I'm not going to read it all to you because it will step on your toes. Um, But Isaiah 1 is full, and, and I mean chop full, of God's accusations against Judah. Um, It it talks about Judah's rebellion against God, and yet it's full of God's desire to bring Judah back into relationship with him. Chapter 1 is full of both judgment and mercy, full of revealing sin and revealing of God's grace. I have fallen in love once again with the book of Isaiah, just digging back into it the last couple of weeks. Try reading through Isaiah 1. It will shock the socks off of you, some of the things that he says. It starts out with God calling heaven and earth to be witnesses against Judah. God tells his people that he was the one that raised them up. God tells them he was the one that nourished them. He was the one that provided for them. God cared for them, and yet they rebelled against him. God then says that, this is, this is rough stuff. He says the people of Judah are dumber than an ox and a donkey. That is tough stuff. I didn't say that. God did. God says an ox knows who owns him and a donkey knows who feeds him, but Judah had no clue. That is rough stuff. That is harsh stuff. God said Judah was dumber than a donkey. And before we start to judge Judah too harshly might be good for us to look in the mirror we've all rebelled against the Lord in one way or another we've all had times where we struggled with our walk with Jesus I know I have but 1 Corinthians 6 11 says and such were some of you but you are washed you are sanctified you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the spirit of of our God. I was arrested once again by the grace of God. The Lord continues in Isaiah 1 to say things like, Alas, sinful nation, you're laden with iniquity. You're a brood of evildoers. And you've provoked the Lord to anger. God was done. He was just done. He was clearly and strongly exposing their sin and said, Look, it's time to get some things right. And God asks, would you be stricken again? And here's where I begin to see more and more, Sister Pruitt, of God's grace in Isaiah chapter 1. And that's really what I want to focus on. It's not about the judgment. It's about the grace of God. And I've got some other things to get. But for now, behind God's question is love and compassion and hope that his people would return to him. That Judah would come and repent. God was saying, look, as long as you stay in your sin, life's going to be rough. (laughs) It's going to be difficult. But behind that is love and compassion saying, if you just come to me and do it my way, I promise you life's going to be a whole lot better. Sister Heatherly, I know if I do it Jesus' way, life goes a whole lot better for me. (laughs) Now, have you ever dealt with a little kid? that did something wrong and you looked at them and said you need to apologize to so and so anybody ever have a kid look at you and say "Mm -mm." have you ever been that kid (laughs) that uh, you knew that you had done wrong and you needed to apologize but you didn't want to I've been guilty and if we're honest we all have But the grace of God pulls us back in. God continues his indictment of Judah, and he goes so far. This, I mean, it's rough. You thought it was bad when he called them dumber than an ox and a donkey. God continues his indictment of Judah and actually calls them Sodom and Gomorrah. This is tough stuff. But when you get to our text, there's this beautiful shift in the chapter. So with all that background, I want to read our text again. 
Isaiah 1, 16 through 20. Wash you, make you clean. Put away the evil of your doings from before mine eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do well. Seek judgment. Relieve the oppressed. Judge the fatherless. Plead for the widow. Come now. Let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If you be willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be delivered with the sword. Did you catch the covenant? Yeah, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. Did you catch the covenant in verse 19? If you're willing, if you're obedient, all will be well. And with that covenant, we can get back to go, Johnny, go. God extended his grace to Judah. He told him to repent. But God does invite them back into relationship with him. He says, though you've been stained deeply by your sin, come to me. I'll wash it clean. I'll make it good. Grace, y'all. It doesn't matter how horrible the sin. I can wash it all away, make you pure and holy again. That's an amazing picture of the grace and mercy of God. And I have experienced that. I look at my life, Sister Romine, and I think, man, God has brought me so far. There have been times where I have just felt so ashamed of myself, but the grace and the mercy of God and the very fact that we are all here sitting in this room is proof that God loves us and wants to draw us into his relationship. Oh, how I love him. There's a song that says, where would I be? You only know. I'm glad you see through eyes of love, a hopeless case, an empty place, if not for grace. I'm thankful for that grace. 2 Corinthians 5, 14 and 15 says, For the love of Christ constraineth us. That means it holds us. Because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. There's something about the grace and the love and the mercy that we've received that should draw us into a deeper relationship with the Lord. Sister Wanda, I, I told my friends yesterday, I said, there's, you know, I, I've walked this way for, for a long time, but there's this hunger to go deeper. There's this hunger to want to know Jesus more and more than I've ever known him in my entire life because his love has been drawing me in. His, his grace has been pulling me into his presence. Oh, the grace of God that draws us in to a relationship with Jesus. And I feel like I'm, I'm just a, a repeating um, parakeet here. I, just every lesson the last few times has been grace, grace, grace. I can't get away from what God has done in my life. I've seen the mighty grace of God, and it has taken me through so much. And here is what I have found, Sister Lily, is that grace, when we embrace the grace that God gives to us, it will draw us into a covenant relationship with him. Covenants in Scripture are legally binding. In other words, it's not just a promise between uh, a couple of people. It is a binding agreement between two parties that keep both parties together until death, literally until death, period. There were a lot of Old Testament covenants that was sealed by blood. I won't get into all of that. It's fascinating, but we don't have time this morning. But getting into the thought of just the covenant, it was a life long commitment that only death could break and though we see many unconditional covenants in scripture and i thank god for god so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son god gave whether we were going to believe or not but he gave oh thank god for his grace <laughs> I do see a ton of conditional covenants, and Isaiah 1, 19 and 20 is one of those. If you're willing and if you're obedient, you will be blessed. To be blessed by the Lord Jesus, y'all, can I be real? We got to be willing to do what he says. And not only do we need to be willing, but we also need to be obedient to his word. Jesus told a parable in Matthew chapter 21 about a dad who went to two of his sons. And Sister Tina, he went to his first son and said, Hey, son, would you go and work in the vineyard for me today? And the son looked at him and said, mm -mm, I don't think so. And 
the dad walks away, and he goes to his other son. And he says, son, would you work in the vineyard today? And the boy says, absolutely, dad, I got you. I will do whatever you ask me to do. There's a problem. The first son, who said, I don't think so, Brother Pruitt, had a change of heart. And he actually did go and work in the vineyard. The second son that said, absolutely, I will do whatever it is that you tell me to do, didn't do diddly squat. Who was the obedient one? Who was the willing one? It was the first son. When there's a heart change and a desire to please our father, that's the right way to go. Frankly, I think the first son's name was Johnny. That's what I'm going to call him. I'm going to call that first son Johnny, Sister Heatherly. And this is where kind of my silly thoughts can get me a little bit in trouble. The chorus of that Chuck Berry song that I mentioned at the beginning tells the story of telling Johnny to go. Go, do what you're supposed to do. And though it is slightly out of context, I get it. The idea of Johnny being willing and obedient to do what he was supposed to do is still there. Johnny had to have a heart, a willing heart, to go out and do his music. Saints of the Most High God. We are called to walk willingly in obedience to the Lord. Will we go? Will we... <laughs> Janny be good will we be obedient to the Lord now I don't know about you I can't tell you for sure because I don't know every part of your life but what I do know is that Isaiah 53 6 tells my story all we like sheep have gone astray we have turned everyone to his own way and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all Romans three twenty three for all of sin and come short of the glory of God but Such were some of you, but you're washed. You are sanctified. You are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus. We've all been as guilty as Judah in Isaiah 1. I know I have. There have been times I've had to go to an altar and say, God, I, I, I didn't get this quite right. Yet Jesus has always made a way, a beautiful way through his blood to walk in covenant with him. So Isaiah 118, come, let us reason together. Or we could say, go. <laughs> go, Janie, go. Go, Pastor, go. Go, Sister Romine, go, go. Be a willing and obedient child of God. There is blessing when we are obedient to him. And we might think of financial blessing or uh, physical blessing and, and physical healing, and those are amazing, and God has given that to me, and I'm so thankful. But, oh, man, the blessing of walking in pure relationship with Jesus to know that his blood has covered my life, that his grace has been poured into me, that is the blessing that I want. I want to be willingly obedient to him because, y'all, I want that blessing from the Lord. So when I hear Jesus say, go, Janny, go, I want to say, yes, sir, I'm going. I want to do exactly what it is that the Lord has said for me to do. That actually kind of makes it funny when I fussed a little bit yesterday, but I want to be obedient unto the Lord. There's nothing like the peace and the joy in the Holy Ghost when we are walking willingly, obediently unto our God. Psalm 1611 says, Thou wilt show me the path of life in thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. Romans 14, 17, for the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, thank God for it, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. When I look at my life, Pastor and Sister Romine and I had this conversation not too terribly long ago. There is something about knowing that there's peace of God in your heart. It makes all the difference in the world when we are surrendered unto the Lord Jesus. When we are walking willingly, obediently unto him, it brings a peace and a joy and a holiness to our lives that is uncomparable. It is uncomparable. 
Sister Wanda, I think this is part of what has been driving my hunger for more of Jesus. I'm finding myself going back to an old song. I don't know how many of you know it. I know Pastor and Sister Romine do, but uh, Sister Wanda might know it. But there's an old, old chorus that says, Make me what I ought to be. Help me to be more like thee. Help me come up higher till thy face I see. Make me what I ought to be. Or what a song that, that we sing a little bit more often here is, I will be what you want me to to be. I'll say yes, Lord, I agree. My desire passionately is to be what you want me to be. That's what I will be. The Lord Jesus has brought every single one in this room a mighty long way. I look around at your beautiful faces and I see the grace of God, Sister Tina. I do. I look around at uh, the amazing pastor son-in-law that is in this room, Logan, and I see the grace of God. I've been thinking an awful lot about Sister Paula. Sis, you should have been dead over a year ago. The doctors were not giving you hope over a year ago. I remember sitting in the sanctuary like June or July of last year talking with you and Pastor and Sister Pat, talking about funeral arrangements. But oh, the grace of God. I will be what you called me to be. Oh, the grace of God should bring us and change our wants and our desires and our heart and our focus to go deeper into a relationship with him. I know it was kind of silly to use that Chuck Berry song, Go, Johnny, Go, and yet, as the Lord's been, I've, I have been chewing on this for two weeks as I have just been chewing on this, as I've been thinking about this, as I've been digesting this, all I can think was, God, I, when you say go, I want to go. When you say do, I want to do. When you say, Jan, I need you to speak this, or I need you to say that, I, I want to be that kind of obedient child to the Lord. So the question is this, and I think I know the answer, because if, if yes is not the answer, you wouldn't be here this morning. Do we really want to be that kind of willing and obedient to the Lord? Will you stand with me? I want to read Isaiah 119 again, because we can talk about being obedient. But did you check out the last phrase? If you be willing and obedient. It doesn't just stop there, Sister Heavenly. Oh, Sister Johanna, it doesn't just stop and say, if you're just willing and obedient, baby girl. It says, you're going to be blessed. <laughs> it's going to be amazing, Brother Nathaniel. It's going to be fantastic when we walk with the Lord. There is blessing. So go. <laughs> go. Johnny, go. Go. Be good. Be willing. Be obedient. Follow the Lord Jesus with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And blessings beyond compare will be ours to feast into the presence of the Lord. Love, joy, peace, joy in the Holy Ghost. Joy that is unspeakable and full of glory. Peace that is uncomparable to anything. It's uncomprehensible. The peace that the Lord Jesus will give us when we are walking with him. So go, go, Johnny, insert your name, be good, be willing, and be obedient to follow the Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for your word. Thank you, Father, for your presence. 
Thank you for your word, your anointing. Thank you for the blessing that you give to us, your people. You are great and you are mighty to be praised. I thank you for your grace that you showed us. I thank you for your mercy. I thank you for your blood that washes us clean. I praise you for that. I thank you, God, for your covenants. You are a covenant-keeping God. I pray that you would bless your people, that you would be with us in worship service today. Be glorified. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You're dismissed. Let's get ready for worship service.